Thank you. So the floor is up to you, Andrea, and thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Massimo, and uh, welcome to all of you. There's some 75 odd people, and I do hope you enjoy the talk. It's very much a preliminary talk, and it's going to be partly about the uh, new uh, WHO uh, system for reporting lymph node cytopathology, but it's also going to be about um, generally how we look at lymph nodes in cytopathology. Okay, so we signed an MOU with the WHO, with the International Agency for Research on Cancer, and that's a MOU with the between the IAC and WHO. And the key uh, element of all of this is that we want to be able to um, promote the use of standardised nomenclature and diagnostic cytopathological criteria in cytopathology. Um, I'll come back to these aims in a minute when we address them specifically about the lymph node uh, reporting system. Um, what have we done so far since we signed the agreement in early 2020? Despite COVID, the lung and the pancreatic ability reporting systems have been written and are going uh, into technical editing at present. The lymph node reporting system has been written and is now entering pathology editing. Uh, soft tissue reporting system uh, has been written and it's just going through its final stages of the authors and editors uh, having their uh, input and then it will go into pathology editing. Um, and the reporting system structure and categories have been established by an international consensus by the expert editorial boards, uh, which have been set up under the IARC uh, guidelines and methodology. And this is really the first time for these four systems. And the risk and latency has been attached as far as possible to these new reporting systems. And we've attached to them also each category uh, has subsequent diagnostic workup guidelines uh, or prefer recommendations. Uh, the key, also what has happened is that the, by consensus, we've established in those expert editorial boards, the key diagnostic criteria in cytopathology for, for specific non-neoplastic lesions and for neoplasms and cancers. And really this is the first time we've got an international consensus um, by one body, in this case, the expert editorial boards. There's always been textbooks and articles and journals and so on, but now there's an international consensus on what features actually make up each of these lesions. So what are the categories? There's five categories. There's an insufficient, inadequate, non-diagnostic category. There's benign, a typical suspicious for malignancy and malignant. And we're generating from the literature a risk of malignancy for each category. And that is then directly linked to a recommendation for further diagnostic testing aimed at achieving a specific diagnosis uh, or refining perhaps a differential diagnosis. The categories are being used to communicate with the clinician, but a specific diagnosis or a differential diagnosis, which can be further refined by ancillary testing is still the aim of all cytopathology reporting and is paramount in the report. The categories are to assist the clinician and the management of the patient, but we're still trying to reach as specific a diagnosis as we currently can. And obviously there are limited publications on the risk and links of each category because uh, in many cases, these are brand new reporting systems. The insufficient and adequate non-diagnostic category from a lymph node, spleen or thymus is one which for qualitative and or quantitative reasons, we use this category. It does not permit a reliable interpretation. So we include cases uh, where there's insufficient cells or false quality smearing, air drying artifacts related to fixation and or obscuring material. Uh, in some cases with insufficient cytopathological lymphoid material, needle rinsings may subsequently provide a diagnosis through a cell block, flow cytometry or cell blocks, whatever, and other ancillary testings such as cytogenetic. So this may actually allow us to step out of the insufficient category, upgrade it if you like. In general, repeat finite biopsy is a recommendation, particularly with rapid on uh, rapid on-site evaluation and a core needle biopsy if required. Each department or institution should choose one term and use it consistently. Um, re recommendation is that we correlate with the imaging and clinical findings. And some cytopathologists will use the term non-diagnostic. Um, and include it in this category for cases where there's good lymphoid material, 
but it doesn't explain the imaging or the clinical findings. Other people would place such categories where they have good lymphoid material in the benign category with a caveat that the material may not represent the target lesion. At this present time, uh, the reporting system accepts both, both uh, positions on this, but you should choose one term and stick to it. Okay, the benign categories, uh, we use that when a, the material shows unequivocal benign features that may or may not be specific for a particular infectious or non-infectious neoplastic process. Um, includes normal lymphoid components and inflammatory processes, including separative granulomatous inflammation, specific infections, or just generalized inflammatory processes. Non-specific inflammatory material or reactive pattern can vary obviously with the stage of the disease in a lymph node or with the immune response of the patient. Fine needle biopsy may demonstrate the infective agent, of course, in routine stains, our Papanicolaou and our uh, Gimsa stains, for instance, filariasis. Or we may use a special stain to make the specific diagnosis, such as a Zeal Nielsen stain or similar stains for tuberculosis. Ancillary testing, such as PCR and microbiological culture for organisms, a cell block for organisms with specialized stains, or flow cytometry confirming a reactive lymphoid population, all are very important, um, very important ancillary tests. What about the benign category? Well, it includes viral infections, autoimmune processes, and other lesions can all produce, which can all produce a wide range of lymphoid patterns. Predominantly, these are follicular hyperplasia, an immunoblastic reaction, a prominent histiocytosis, or a prominent mycytosis, and of course, necrosis. And these types of patterns may be mixed. If the features are benign, but a precise diagnosis cannot be made, the features should be described and a differential diagnosis provided. In some cases, a distinction from a lymphoma can be difficult. For instance, follicular hyperplasia may be difficult to distinguish from follicular lymphoma. A viral immunoblastic reaction may be difficult to distinguish from a lymphoma, high-grade lymphoma, immunoblastic lymphoma. So this is an area of debate in current research. Individual pathology pathologist's ability to diagnose various inflammatory reactive patterns on cytopathology alone as benign versus placing them in the atypical category will vary with local practice and expertise, but it'll also vary with the expectations and the support of clinical colleagues. If the features raise a differential diagnosis that includes lymphoma, then this is no longer a benign case and is placed in the atypical category. Obviously, as with all categories, correlation with clinical and the imaging finding, if you have imaging findings, if you have them, is important. Okay, so the atypical category, a specimen categorized as atypical demonstrates features predominantly seen in benign lesions and minimal features, minimal features that may raise the possibility of a malignant lesion. But there's insufficient features, either in the number or the quality, to diagnose a benign or, on the other hand, a malignant process or lesion. This includes a tip of uncertain significance for lesions, including the rare possible epithelial inclusions, non-lymphoid lesions, such as, such as histiocytic proliferation, but it also includes the concept, concept of atypical lymphoid cells of uncertain significance. ALICE includes any case in which the lymphoid material present, suggests a benign process, but cannot totally exclude lymphoma due to a paucity of material, or because the cytopathological features, although appearing mostly benign, some of the features raise the possibility of lymphoma, so we put it in this category. An atypical category in any reporting system helps maintain a high negative predictive value for the benign category. Uh, cytopathological features that make the smear atypical should always be stated in the report, and the possible differential diagnosis should be stated and discussed. This is not meant to be a wastebasket of the cases that are just too difficult. We need to be trying to say why each of these cases is atypical when we assess them and report them. Usually you require repeat fine needle biopsy to get more material, the cytopathology and ancillary testing. And of course this most frequently, if it's available, will be flow cytometry or core needle biopsy. 
uh, your flow or core needle biopsy are not available, excision biopsy of the lymph node or a watch and wait policy may be suggested dependent on the clinical situation and the clinician's decision. For instance, a young patient with, with clinical presentation and infectious mononucleosis may have a fine needle biopsy showing prominent uh, immunoblasts and the decision could be what made to, to watch and see if the lymph adenopathy recedes. And of course you can do serology and you'll then have a clinical outcome to correlate. Another example, cellular smears with, with a predominantly uniform population of small lymphoid cells and a differential diagnosis of a reactive, uh, sorry, reactive or resting lymph node, but a differential diagnosis or CLL, small cell lymphocytic lymphoma, or possibly mantle cell lymphoma. In this scenario, flow cytometry is very useful in the differential of these small lymphoid cell cases, but the initial cytopathology report might well be atypical, stating that this is the differential diagnosis that has been raised. Of course, you can also do a core needle biopsy or excision biopsy, depending on the clinical situation and the clinician's decision. Um, if flow cytometry uh, or core needle biopsy are not available, as I said, excision biopsy or watch and wait may be suggested. I'll move on from here. Okay, what about the suspicious or malignancy category? Specimens categorized as suspicious for malignancy demonstrate some cytopathological features suggestive of malignancy, but with insufficient features, either number or quality to make an unequivocal, unequivocal diagnosis of malignancy. So features suggest malignancy, but there's a paucity of material or the cytopathological features are not sufficiently definite to make a malignant diagnosis. Or there may be discrepant features on some of your smears. This category supports a high positive predictive value for the malignant category. The report should describe the suspicious features and wherever possible provide a conclusion as to which lesion is suspected or provide a differential diagnosis. Obviously includes lesions suspicious for hemolymphoid malignancy and also those suspicious for metastatic carcinomas for metastatic tumors. And ciliary testing, including flow cytometry for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or a cell block with immunochemistry for carcinoma or a CD30 for Hodgkin's lymphoma may be definitive and allow you to upgrade the category from suspicious for malignancy to malignant. So repeat fine needle biopsy or core needle biopsy, or in some cases, excision may biopsy may be recommended but further management is required. Okay, the malignant category is applied when the lesion demonstrates unequivocal cytopathological features of malignancy. So there should ideally be a constellation of key diagnostic cytopathological features to make a specific diagnosis. So we don't want any discrepant features or a specific group of diagnoses such as metastatic carcinoma or large cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma or Hodgkin's lymphoma. These are cases in which the material allows us to make a malignant diagnosis and then place that particular case into a group of diagnoses. Diagnosis of malignancy is possible without ancillary testing. Ancillary testing is often required to make a specific diagnosis. So you could use immunochemistry on the cell block to diagnose the type and origin of a metastatic carcinoma. The use of flow cytometry obviously is very, very important in confirming the diagnosis of lymphoid malignancies. And cytogenetics can also be used to diagnose a specific type of lymphoma. So ancillary testing and lymph node finding the biopsy cytopathology. So many diagnoses can be made on finding the biopsy cytopathology, but one of the key things the take home messages from today is that we have to recognize the limitations of the fine needle biopsy. And we also have to recognize that ancillary testing really uh, becomes vitally important in the use of uh, fine needle biopsy cytopathology of lymph nodes. They add great value to the actual use of the fine needle biopsy. Flow cytometry and cytogenetics, as mentioned, can make specific lymphoma diagnoses. Uh, PCR and cultures can diagnose specific infections immunohistochemistry, and in some cases, of course, going onto molecular testing, such in, as in metastatic lung cancers, can make specific diagnoses 
including specific di uh, targets for therapeutics, all based on the finely laceration biopsy material. So it gives us a start of morphological diagnosis, and that then acts as a, as a benchmark control against, uh, against which all the ancillary tests can be measured. And it triages the material in a, in a most cost-effective way for this ever-increasing use of an array of sophisticated ancillary tests. It's absolutely essential that cytomorphology and all subsequent ancillary test results should be issued in an integrated cytopathology report. Now, I recognize that the, the his, history of some of these ancillary yeah, tests and their use and establishment in various institutions and hospitals, each has its own history. And there may be variants to this, but it's ideal that all the reports should be in the same document. There should be a final integrated report and conclusion. And if that's not possible, then the cytomorphology report must include reference to the other uh, outcomes, the other ancillary tests. And so again, this will depend on the institution, but the cytology uh, diagnosis can be provided as a provisional report recommending specific ancillary tests, or it may be issued as a definitive uh, report once all the ancillary tests have been gathered in. So on a very basic level, a granulomatous lymphadenitis uh, with mycobacteria on the zeal nil stain can be a definitive diagnosis. And the culture and PCR for drug sensitivity then can be mentioned and are to follow. Um, in cases uh, such as lymphoma, um, Pia Zeppa coined a term, the hemidocytopathologist. In other words, this is the cytopathologist who um, then orders the ancillary tests and interprets their results wherever they are performed in their institution or outside of their institution and integrates them into the actual report. They may do this by incorporating actual verbatim from uh, different ancillary tests or by summarizing them in a final conclusion. Wrong way. Um, as I said, it can make the diagnosis more specific. Uh, large cell lymphoma, which is called malignant on a smear, um, can be confirmed on flow cytometry as a B cell lymphoma, and then we can do fish for CMIC and uh, B cell 2 on the cell block material, confirming in this case a double hit so-called high-grade lymphoma. This term, term's gonna change, but a high-grade lymphoma. We can have metastatic carcinoma, which we can diagnose on the cytopathology. In a lymph node, um, the diagnosis of perhaps adenocarcinoma will be made, followed by immunochemistry, confirming this with TTF1 and Epsin-A perhaps, and a negative P40. And this can then be followed by molecular testing on the cell block or slide scraping, for that matter, to diagnose whatever molecular abnormality is present, which then becomes a target therapy. So uh, coming back to what the aims of this process of producing a reporting system with its categories and publishing it, uh, the aims for the lymph node reporting system are really common with the other systems and they are to promote the use of cytopathology, in cytopathology of standardized nomenclature and effective reporting systems that link categories and specific diagnoses to diagnostic and management algorithms. We're really, in most cases, talking about the, the management of further diagnosis. And all of this is trying to assist clinicians to manage patients. patients. So we've also aimed to establish key diagnostic criteria in cytopathology, as I mentioned, by an international consensus, and that we hope will lead to better quality diagnostic assessment by cytopathologists and better reporting of cytopathology in lymph node cases. Um, the, we'll be able to link the cytopathology textbook on the website to the hematopathology blue book, now coming into its fifth edition and about to be published um, in the near future. And this will bring a, a dynamic practical link between cytopathology and surgical pathology. We hope this will raise the profile and promote the use of fine needle biopsy cytopathology by increasing awareness of its current diagnostic role and its potential future role in the era of personalized medicine. This is increasingly happening in developed countries and will spread 
globally, but it's the potential role for final aspiration biopsy in the era of personalized medicine. And this will be based on ancillary testing, including molecular pathology, utilizing small biopsies, such as fine needle aspiration biopsies, and the material you gain from them, including the cell block. And of course, also that includes core needle biopsies. Ultimately, we want to improve patient care and outcomes through the use of cytopathology internationally in developed and low middle income countries. I'm now briefly going to go on and talk about an algorithmic approach. And this is based on a book that I wrote with uh, Dr. William Getty from Toronto. And I want to acknowledge uh, that many of the microphotographs and the, 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 pro the approach and system uh, were developed by myself and Bill Getty. Of course, lymph node biopsy technique, I'm not going to go into great detail, but we do recommend they use both an air-dried Ginza and alcohol-fixed Papanicolaou stain slides. Of course, you might be using a hematopsin and eosin stain on your alcohol-fixed slides. Um, and each has its own benefits, but we recommend that you should use both in almost every case. Um, the Ginza stain gives, uh, obviously we use it for rose, um, and instead of for fungi and other infections, for background, for uh, mesenchymal stroma and the diagnosis of reactive uh, process and lymphomas. The PAP gives us much better nuclear details and I'll say straight up is much better in when we're assessing small cell lymphomas and metastases. But no single stain is perfect. And of course we can then add all our specialist stains for infections. Um, and really whenever we think there's an infectious case, we should be setting aside material for cultures we don't always know something's going to be infectious. So when we're doing rows, we ought to be trying to get um, containers which could be used for cultures. And then when we do our rows, we can then um, triage and then use them for other purposes such as cell block. Um, remember, d stain PAP or h &E can be used for various staining, including diapas and GMS. Um, and ultimately, because lymph nodes often are superficial, they're easily accessible, if we do have a situation where we, we don't have adequate material, it's insufficient, or we want more material for ancillary testing, final aspiration biopsy is a simple, relatively non-invasive procedure. So here, uh, Bill Getty's hands, um, the syringe and the Kamiko gun, but this is an excellent uh, teardrop smear. Here we can see it's stained. Why do we want the teardrop? Why do we want it two thirds of the way up the slide so that it's not going off the slide? We want this because usually the best area to assess will be in the middle portion of such a smear. But in some cases, this thick end will allow us to diagnose lesions, which are usually high grade lymphomas, where the material, where the cells are fragile and get damaged and crushed. In other cases where we've got a carcinoma in a more sclerotic background, um, which requires perhaps firmer smearing, the tail end of the smear will allow us to assess that because it'll uh, disperse the cells in a manner which will allow us to make a diagnosis. So this is the ideal shape. Um, we routinely, or we recommend routine preparation of cell block. Uh, you can use normal saline rinses or RPMI rinses or whatever you use locally. Um, and generally if we, at Rose particular, particularly if we're suspecting uh, metastatic cancers or we think we need flow cytometry, we really, in the cell block, we'd like a separate pass, not just the needle rinsing of the various uh, needle passes. And again, we can do all our routine stains for infection on that cell block. Um, we can do the full range of immunohistochemistry, um, and then we can go on and do fish on the cell block. Of course, we can also do that on direct smears. Um, we can even do electron microscopy if we wish uh, on, on the cell block or material we've placed directly in a glutaraldehyde. This is not commonly done, obviously. And of course, flow cytometry is an excellent adjunct to cytomorphology. Okay, so um, what sort of things are we looking for in uh, pattern recognition of, of lymph nodes? We're basically looking for pattern and then cell type assessment. So it's really a, like a two-step uh, process. We can have a suppurative pattern, including specific infections, a granulomatous pattern, including specific infections. We can have lymphoid material that's mixed and heterogeneous. 
with small lymphocytes predominating. And with that, in that case, we can be talking about follicular hyperplasia. It's got germinal centers, such as in toxo. We can have predominantly immunoblasts. We can have predominantly histocytes. We can have predominantly plasma cells. All of these are associated with small lymphocytes and a mixed lymphoid pattern. Of course, a mixed heterogeneous lymphoid pattern is also seen um, in follicular lymphomas, where we have a different cell type predominating. Small lymphoid, sorry, small lymphocytes do not predominate. And of course, we can have follicular lymphoma and marginal zone lymphoma in that pattern. What about a, a pattern where we have lymphoid material that's heterogeneous and there are atypical lymphoid cells in that? That should alert us that, that we might be looking at a peripheral T cell lymphoma or angium immunoblastic T cell lymphoma with a mix of heterogeneous mix of atypical lymphoid cells. What about where we have a lymphoid background? but it's heterogeneous, but there are alien cells. And I define these as any cells which are not normally seen in a, a lymph node, including reactive lymph node. So in this situation, and we could have nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin's, a lymphocyte rich Hodgkin's, classic Hodgkin's lymphoma, T cell rich, histocyte rich, large B cell lymphoma can give us this pattern. And metastatic cancer is showing a, a diffuse pattern where the tissue fragments are broken up and we have single alien cells. And of course, sometimes an immunoblastic reactive pattern mixed with follicular hyperplasia can produce produced large immunoblastic cells, uh, which can look a little bit alien in that background and uncommonly seen in lymph nodes, but obviously seen in spleen, extramedullary hematopoiesis. What about where we have a monomorphic pattern? A small lymphoid cells, not lymphocytes, okay? Except when we have a resting lymph node. So we've got a monomorphic pattern. Now we're getting away in all these other situations from having lymphocytes as a predominant cell. Now we've got, if you like, a typical small lymphoid cell. So we've got CLL, mantle cell lymphoma, lymphoblastic lymphoma, multiple myeloma. Of course, these cells can become intermediate, even perhaps large uh, in a mix, more mixed population uh, of size, not of cell type, but of size a lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, such as in Waterstrom's mastocytosis and follicular lymphoma, particularly when we have a centrocytic predominant population. What about a lymphoid population, which is monomorphic, but now it's predominantly large cells, maybe intermediate, but large. And here's our, if you like, differential diagnosis of this pattern. This large B cell, Burkitt's lymphoma, anaplastic large cell lymphoma, lymphocyte depleted Hodgkin lymphoma, which is exceedingly rare, and you can have situations like in breast, plant, breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma and occasionally metastatic malignancies. Well, I shouldn't say occasionally, but metastatic malignancies such as melanoma and carcinomas, classically things like uh, lobular carcinoma of the breast can give us a dispersed cell pattern, which can look monomorphic. Um, another pattern is where we have spindle cells, uh, or other related lesions such as Kaposi sarcoma, histocytic sarcoma, interdigitating dendritic cell sarcoma, and follicular dendritic cell sarcoma. Be aware that some of the terminology here is changing in the new um, WHO book. And of course, we can have epithelial tissue fragments, which gives us, in many situations, many hospitals, many hospitals which are dealing mainly with solid cancers. Um, this may well be the most common thing you see. So really it's two steps. There's pattern recognition at low power, and we can rapidly diagnose the most common lymph node lesions, at least to put them in a group, metastatic cancers, granulomatous lymphadenitis, suppuration in a lymph node. And of course, then we can start to assess lymphoid material, whether it's reactive or lymphomatous. But this is our rapid low power uh, diagnostic. And then we try and do cell type assessment, gone from pattern to cell type assessment. We do this at high power and we confirm the diagnosis and separate, separate the lymphoid processes by assessing the predominant lymphoid cell type. So we confirm at high power what sort of metastatic carcinoma it is. Um, and then we go on, if, it's, if it is lymphoid, to try and as far as possible, assess the predominant cell type. And we repeat this process, low power, high power, pattern cell type, and we try and integrate them into a diagnosis or a differential diagnosis. 
And again, assessing the central area of a well-made games or perhaps stone smear is pretty essential. And of course, there are problems with poor finely laceration biopsy technique, hemodilution, fibrin clot. Do we have adequate cells? Um, often poor smearing technique and hemodilution can affect the pattern, but then we fall back on cell type assessment. Liquid-based preparations are not recommended. Um, some may prefer them, but they're not recommended. They lose the pattern and, of course, they're difficult to get a game sustain. Um, so the pattern, and, and even in cell type, can be characteristic, but it may vary, as I stated before, starting with one pattern, changing another pattern. It may be a mixed pattern at any stage uh, of the disease evolution, or it can vary with the patient's age or immune competency. And many have variants with different smear and architectural patterns. So this is not as easy as it might appear, as we know. Um, but often, fine needle biopsies are used to, to exclude metastatic carcinoma. And if we find there's no metastatic carcinoma, but there is, there is lymphoid material, uh, we should take the opportunity to do everything we possibly can to make a diagnosis. Um, Dr. Razi, no, Razi, could you please mute yourself? Okay, so what do we do? We try and so we talk and work with the operators. We talk and teach those making the smears. Um, we use rows whenever possible. Okay, so we can provide an assessment of adequacy. We know we know rows decreases inadequate case percentages, and we can provide a provisional diagnosis. And if you're a cytopathologist, or at the very least, we can triage the material to be as most cost effective in selecting our ancillary testing. And we can select cases where we do need uh, and a core biopsy. Wherever possible, and I recognize it's not always available, we should use flow cytometry and immunohistochemistry chemistry on cell blocks to confirm diagnosis when we are doing lymph node cytopathology. And at the very best, uh, at the very least, I should say, we can exclude metastatic cancer and infection and then select the involved nodes for excision. For instance, Hodgkin's may involve one node in the, uh, up in the cervical chain and not another. So the fine needle biopsy can help us assess which lymph, which lymph node to take out. So three questions. Are there tissue fragments present when we're assessing a lymph node? Are the dispersed cells lymphoid? And are they monotonous or heterogeneous? Using cell type assessment, do small lymphocytes predominate or what other type of lymphoid cell is present? A tissue fragment, these are microbiopsies or fragments, uh, most classically seen in metastatic cancers, but you can see germinal centers or follicular nodules in lymphomas. Uh, and you can see granulomas and we may see granulation tissue. And in a lymph node, you get lymphovascular tangles, as we can see here, these are capillaries with lymphoid material in the background, capillaries, capillaries here. This is not really of much help to us in assessing lymph nodes. This is not really what we're talking about. We talk about tissue fragments in lymph nodes. We're looking for fragments which are granulomas, metastatic cancer, or in some cases in well smear material, germinal centers or follicular nodules. So here we've got actually a follicular lymphoma and you can see the follicular nodules in this well-made smear. Again, follicular nodule. And when you look into the follicular nodule, you can see these cells, very important cells, the dendritic reticulin cells, which are oval nuclei, very fine, even chromatin and prominent, often single nucleoli, often seen in uh, what Bill Getty coined as kissing pairs. And they're in a the background of centrocytes and occasional uh, centroblasts. And this is a follicular nodule. None of these cells here are small lymphocytes. And when we go outside, of what we think is the follicular nodule, we can see that we've got these lymphoid cells, which are a mix of centrocytes and perhaps a very occasional centroblast. Dendritic cells don't have cytoplasm when we see them on a smear because they're dendritic processes, you can't see them. And here again at high power. Here again, this is a follicular lymphoma. And again, we can see these vague nodules of the follicular lymphoma. So these are our three tissue fragments. And from the textbook that Bill Gett and I wrote, this looks incredibly complex, but just take it three questions at a time. Are there tissue fragments? Is lymphoid material present? Do small lymphocytes predominate? 
three questions as we work our way down through the lymph node assessment. And if uh, tissue fragments are present, um, the next question is, is lymphoid material present? And of course, sometimes you may not have a lymph node, most classically in an auxiliary lymph node, which turns out to be auxiliary tail of a breast. And you can have suppuration and granulomas and metastatic cancers, all to the exclusion of lymphoid material in a lymph node aspirate because the suppuration, the granulomas, the necrosis, or the cancer have replaced the lymph node. And of course, you may also have a situation uh, where the infectious agent is visible and can be associated with various inflammatory patterns. But you can see the filariasis and see the worms uh, on, on the actual direct smears. Now, if tissue fragments are present uh, and there is lymphoid material, the next question is, do small lymphocytes predominate? And if they do, um, then we could be looking at, at the rare epithelial inclusions or metastases with residual lymph node. And the residual lymph node is mainly small lymphocytes. Or we may have granulomas, or we may have an infectious agent in a background of small lymphocytes. So in this scenario, if we have tissue fragments if, and lymphoid material is present and small lymphocytes predominate, yes, we're talking about follicular hyperplasia, which will have a mixed population of lymphoid cells. It may have germinal centers in well smeared material. Dr. Hayati, could you mute yourself, please? Um, but if we have tissue fragments and there's lymphoid material present and small lymphocytes do not predominate, then we're most likely looking at a follicular lymphoma or perhaps a marginal zone lymphoma. What about if we have no tissue fragments uh, and there's no lymphoid material where well, we can have metastasis, necrosis or suppuration replacing the node. If there are no tissue fragments and lymphoid material is present, then do small lymphocytes predominate? The same question, if the answer is yes, we could be looking at a re resting lymph node or non-specific reactive node. We could be looking at an immunoblastic lymph node or sinus cystocytosis. What about if there are no tissue fragments, the lymphoid material is present and small lymphocytes do predominate, but we've got these unusual large non-lymphoid alien cells. And here we can have nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin's, lymphocyte rich Hodgkin's, and the classic Hodgkin's lymphomas. Of course, these, as well as the lymphocytes, will often have a typical background, at least in classic lymph uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma of eosinophils and plasma cells with or without histocytes. So it's not just lymphocytes, small lymphocytes, but they do, in most cases, predominate in these smears. What about no tissue fragments, lymphoid material, and small lymphocytes do not predominate? So here we've got, we come down to our small celled lymphomas, where small lymphocytes are not seen, predominating, uh, or we could have heterogeneous mixed cells, which are our T cell lymphomas, or we could have large cells. And these are our large cell lymphomas. Of course, there are other large cell lymphomas as well, not listed. So if you have a look at this algorithm, these green uh, processes are all small celled. Across the orange, these are usually mixed. They have a mixed population. And here across the bottom, we've got our large celled processes, including follicular lymphomas, going all the way across to our large cell lymphomas and so on. So we can talk about metastatic carcinomas and diagnose squamous cell carcinomas. We can diagnose metastatic melanomas. And this is, in, as I said, in many of our situations, one of the most common things we see. And these are our, our malignant categories. Of course, these are going to be part of our benign categories, as are our infectious processes. Our malignant process, of course, our malignant diagnosis, sometimes, of course, they may be suspicious, are really going to fall uh, across this area, that met metastases, uh, or they might be down here with our large cell lymphomas, our large cell malignancies, our lymphoid large cell malignancies. And the most common area, if the, in my experience, for trying to work out where, where lesions will be called atypical, is probably across the small celled lymphoma, where it's very difficult at times to make sure we're not looking 
uh, at a mantle cell lymph node, but rather we're looking at a reactive lymph node. Okay, acute suppuration, suppurative granuloma. Each time we see a pattern and we categorize it as benign, as benign, we get a differential diagnosis and the differential diagnosis will vary with where you work in the world. Uh, we don't see uh, cat scratch, sorry, um, tularemia in Australia to any great extent, unless it's, um, but of course, if you go to Southwest uh, USA, it's a, it's a common lesion. Um, filariasis, we see perhaps across the top of tropical Australia, but it's nowhere near the same instance as we have across um, Africa, Central Africa. So each of these will vary depending where we work. Um, of course, sometimes a granuloma, the suppuration or subjective granuloma can be seen rarely with metastatic cancers and Hodgkin's lymphoma. The granulomatous pattern again opens up a differential diagnosis. Once we see those granulomas, are they caseating or are they non-caseating, suggestive of sarcoidosis? Is there a foreign body? Is there something we can polarize? Um, you know, we're dealing with someone who's had a tattoo and now has got a swollen lymph node, et cetera. And again, fungal infections, schistosomiasis, these to a great extent are very geographically, uh, geographical in their, their distribution. Fungal infections, of course, particularly when you get immune compromised patients who are increasing in number, you know, in our communities in developed countries due to cancer therapy. And we did have a very significant number of fungal infections when we had the HIV epidemic. So again, it varies with where you work in the world, but we should always be alert to the possibility of these occurring when we see granulomas lymphadenitis. And you can get a granulomas reaction to metastatic cancers and to lymphomas and Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, so again, are there tissue fragments? Yes. Uh, if the answer is yes, but the tissue fragments are not metastatic or granulomas, but rather lymphoid, this is when we may try and look and see germinal centers or follicular nodules from a follicular lymphoma. Then the question, are the dispersed cells lymphoid? Then we start to say what size are the lymphoid cells, small, intermediate, or large? And is the lymphoid population heterogeneous or homogeneous? Third question, if the dispersed cells are lymphoid, then use cell type assessment. Do small lymphocytes predominant? Okay, so what do we mean by small? Well, less than the diameter of two red cells is generally accepted as meaning small, less than the size of a histocytic nucleus, which in my opinion, vary more in size, but an intact neutrophil, up to 10 microns. So lymphocytes, small centrocytes, maybe occasional centroblasts when they're small. Large lymphoid cells, greater than a histocytic nucleus or neutrophil, and up to 20 microns, or three red cells in diameter. Remember that large lymphoid cells are generally smaller than most carcinomas. The relative size of lymphoid cells and the ability to recognize the range of cell types varies with the state, the degree of drying artifact and distortion by blood. So hemodilution, pore smearing, air drying artifact are all make these uh, distinctions difficult. And of course, we can't always say what a particular lymphoid cell, what it is. We have to recognize that the lymphoid cell types overlap. Individual cells may not be categorizable, but a monotonous predominance of one cell type suggests lymphoma. And of course, when we're talking about size, we're also immediately assessing the NC ratio, the nucleocytoplasmic ratio, the shape of the nucleus, the nature of the cytoplasm, and the chromatin. Is it mature? In other words, coarse, as seen in CLL and flick lymphomas, or is it vesicular? Uh, as seen in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, or is it immature or fine, evenly dispute, uh, dispersed as in lymphoblastic processes? So just very quickly, we can have our small centrocytes such as these, small nucleoli, small clefts, irregularity, or we can have our small lymphocytes. And I'm using a, a Papa Nicolaus stain slide to actually demonstrate this. And here we've got our centroblasts with our often uh, around the sort of equator of the cell and often close to the nuclear or appearing to be attached to the nuclear envelope. So these are our central blasts. Centrocytes, centrocytes, small centrocytes, getting a little bit larger here. 
uh, get away from the concept that all centrocytes are cleaved. Um, many centrocytes just show a little bit more clumping of their chrome and a little bit more opening of their chrome and actually variation in the shape and size and variation here again, giving a bit of a notch. And very quickly, I'm going to move through this. So these again are our centrocytes. He's seen on the Gimsa, a little bit larger, next to a small lymphocyte, the plasma cell with its hoff and its coarse granular chromatin. Um, and then if we move through, very important cell, oval nucleus, poorly defined cytoplasm. And these are our, our dendritic reticulin cells. So here's our kissing pair, oval nuclei, very even nuclear envelope, prominent nuclei, ill-defined cytoplasm, can be seen in pairs next to our large centrocytes, small centrocytes, and so on. Now, about tingible body macrophages, which are uh, in many cases, particularly when we've got a small cell a lymphoid background or small lymphocytes, our tingible body macrophages often are pointed to the fact that we're dealing with a reactive lymph node and a reactive process. Alien cells, where we're really talking about, we're really talking about um, anything that is not normally found in a lymph node. And of course, we've got our Hodgkin cells uh, or reed sternberg cells with their binuclear uh, cells. Um, we can have our nodule lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma, the popcorn cell. We can have hallmark cells of anaplastic large cell lymphoma, and sometimes in these large B cell lymphomas, we can see larger cells. Uh, finally, I'm just going to finish on what are the usual features of lymph node finely laceration biopsy cytopathology? Well, they're usually highly cellular, if they're well done, well made, and usually highly dispersed cell pattern when we find that we're dealing with a lymphoid population and not one of those other things such as metastatic cancer. And of course, we can see fragments of lymphoid cell cytoplasm, or as they are commonly known, lymphoglandular bodies. So I'm going to suggest there's eight lymphoid patterns of reactive lymphomas, lymph nodes uh, with lymphoid tissue fragments. These can be hard to see unless you're dealing with well-made material, but there's a germinal center tissue fragment uh, in a dispersed heterogeneous, predominantly small to intermediate lymphoid cell pattern with small lymphocytes predominating. So this is, these are the hallmarks of follicular hyperplasia. You can have follicular nodules, again, uh, dispersed mixed population, small to intermediate lymphoid cells with centrocytes and centroblasts, not small lymphocytes predominating. The classic here is follicular lymphoma. Um, what about where you don't have tissue fragments, lymphoid patterns? Well, you can have a resting or quiescent or sometimes reactive lymph node, predominantly small lymphocytes without tissue fragments, just a dispersed small lymphocyte population. You can have a, a mixed population, small to intermediate lymphoid cells with small lymphocytes predominating, plus immunoblasts. This is the classic immunoblastic reaction as seen in viral infection. You can have a dispersed mixed population, small to intermediate lymphoid cells with small lymphocytes predominating, and you can have very large numbers of histocytes. So you see this prototypically in Rosai Dorfman disease or sinus histocytosis. The sixth pattern uh, is a dispersed Heterogeneous mixed pattern, small lymphocytes usually predominating, plus other large alien cells. And the prototypical lesion here is Hodgkin's lymphoma. The seventh pattern is dispersed monotonous, predominantly small to intermediate lymphoid cells. Small lymphocytes do not predominate. The lymphoid cells often look atypical. And the prototypical lesion here is mantle cell lymphoma. And you can have a dispersed monotonous population again. These are small. These are intermediate to large with no predominance of small lymphocytes, obviously. And the prototypical lesion here is diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Okay, um, Massimo, I'm going to stop there and ask for questions. Thank you very much, Andrew. It was a really extensive presentation. Uh, I think this is the most uh, needed uh, reporting system because uh, we have to gain again the confidence of our clinicians on uh, the role of lymph node cytopathology. So there are some questions, but before I would like to ask you if uh, already there are some papers 
coming out that uh, use this uh, reporting system and uh, what are the results of the paper of the studies? Okay, so in 2019 at the International Cytology Congress here in Sydney, a group who had been meeting for some 18 months uh, came together, they'd come together in a number of different other centres as well, and in Sydney there were meetings of the group, there were presentations and symposia and discussions with uh, audience members, and uh, led by Pio Zeppa and Immaculata Casalino from Italy, and a whole bunch of the other very uh, extremely well um, regarded cytopathologists came up with a lymphoid uh, lymph node reporting system which was, has been sort of anecdotally called the Sydney system. And they published uh, in Acta Cytologica a paper describing the system. And there have been a number of papers coming out now looking at the Sydney system and how, uh, in looking at its performance indicators and seeing how useful it has been. So there's certainly some published literature on a system which is very similar. That working group that had been the IAC pulled together um, in 2000 and I think 17, early 2018, that group published that. Uh, and then um, when the IAC signed its MOU with uh, the IARC and WHO, um, that group, uh, many of them came into the expert editorial board mm -hmm. um, and have contributed to the WHO system, which is what I've presented. Okay, so I should, I should recognize and acknowledge the work of that group Mm -hmm. um, the editorial board is much larger now, but uh, they were very much involved. So yes, there is some in the, some uh, publications in the literature. Thank you, Andrew. So we can move to the uh, question from the audience. Um, one question is: core needle biopsy or excision biopsy is preferred in non-diagnostic category? Well, I, I think we we've got to say what we're dealing with. We're dealing with. Um, uh, palpable lymph nodes and then a repeat fine needle biopsy um, might be useful, but it depends what um, I think the clinical suspicion is. Mm -hmm. um, we, we recommend across our hospital and its oncology units that we use fine needle aspiration biopsy and then we accompany it with a core needle biopsy. And this is routine even for first strike when you first the patient is first seen. There are reasons for this. The fine needle biopsy gives us information which is complementary to the core needle biopsy. Our flow cytometry team in the hospital much prefer the fine needle biopsy, which has been then rinsed in RPMI. They much prefer that to a millimeter or to two millimeters cut up and mulched of the actual core needle biopsy. And um, if we've got the fine needle biopsy, we've always got that backup of flow cytometry. Um, so if you're dealing with someone who's got a history of lung cancer and they pop up with a, a cervical lymph node, left-sided cervical lymph node, the fine needle biopsy with cell block is normally sufficient to do everything, including molecular pathology. So generally in our institution, uh, we recommend they use both because both, we regard the two tests as complementary. Okay. Um, so that applies across all cytology of lymph nodes. And of course, if you're doing dealing with EBUS um, or EUS situations where it's much more difficult to get the material, then often uh, at ROSE, we will recommend core needle biopsy. If it's lymphoid, uh, I think the same applies as long as we've got good flow cytometry material. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another question, in case of lymph node with only necrosis without any viable cells, in which category should it be? <laughs> well, it's a very interesting question. Um, um, I think probably it would be regarded as insufficient. It's not gonna give us material uh, for flow cytometry or cell block of any use. So it'd probably be called insufficient or other people might use the term non-diagnostic. Mm -hmm. uh, someone saying excellent presentation, I agree with that. And <laughs> you spoke already about the Sydney system. There is a question, there are some remarkable difference in between uh, the WHO and the Sydney system. I'm not aware of any remarkable differences, I'm afraid. Um, I, I think that what may be confusing people is that um, there is an approach to regard the cytopathology of a lymph node as being a step one and then a step two being mm -hmm. the ancillary testing. But I think the WHO editorial board across all the systems we've encountered so far, including lymph node, regards the step two, the ancillary test, as being the hallmarks 
has been the, required wherever we can in cytopathology. And that, that difference of regarding it as a step one, step two um, in the Sydney system, I think has been as morphed as has been incorporated into the general concept that whatever we do inside of pathology, wherever possible, we should have ancillary tests providing us that extra information. The point that I want to make in, from my talk here, and is very much uh, embodied in all the reporting systems, is that wherever possible, we should do the ancillary tests and they should be put into one integrated report. So if we have a concept um, where you report your cytology, um, it, you report your cytopathology, including your cell block, that's one report. Um, the concept that then someone else does the ancillary testing is not, it may happen because of historical reasons, physical reasons in an institution, but ideally all that added information should be part of the final cytopathology report, integrated with the final conclusion. And sometimes that'll be simple. It'll be, you know, metastatic adenocarcinoma and it'll go all the way down to your molecular. In other cases, it may be more difficult because it's been called atypical, the cytopathology, and then the ancillary testing may or may not help in advancing the diagnosis. So I, I, I personally don't think there's very major differences between the yeah. Sydney system and what we've got with the WHO. I think it's just a, in many ways, it's a nuance and it's a sort of, it's a conceptual difference. Uh, thank you. Someone suggests also to use cell block in case of a suspicious metastatic disease, in case you have a, a typical cytology. And someone also asked to explain more about who made the cell block with uh, technique, the syringe, wash syringe, needle. Yes, we, or... rinsed the, the, we rinsed the needle and the syringe, and um, we, we, we use RPMI, um, but n the buffered normal saline is, is pretty good. Um, other people I know uh, rinse their needles in formalin and rinse the needle after making their smears, rinse the material in formalin to make their cell block. I, I don't have a problem with any of these. I would prefer not to have formalin sort mm -hmm. of open on the bench like that. So we use RPMI, uh, Rose, we bring it back to the laboratory, we make decisions, we look at it, if it's lymphoid, we're gonna send the RPMI for flow. Oh no, it's metastatic cancer at Rose, we're gonna do a cell block we won't do flow cytometry. So it's cost effective to do it that way. But basically it's the rinsings of the needle and the syringe and what you put them in, it will depend on your local practice. Um, you already spoke about flow cytometry, but in case you don't have flow cytometry, uh, what about uh, the use of FNA just for training, screening prior, prior to biopsy? Yeah, I mean, this is classically what we did. Uh, <laughs> In my early years, we didn't have flow cytometry. It was very basic, and therefore we the fine needle biopsy. Um, if we found lymphoid, would often come to uh, uh, excision biopsy because in the same era that we didn't have good flow, we didn't have good core biopsies, and we were using, you know, like a bone marrow trophine needle. So fundamentally, it was fine needle biopsy, triage. Oh, this is granulomatous, or this is benign, uh, or no, this is metastatic cancer, or no, this is atypical lymphoid query malignant lymphoma. So we'd go to excision. If you don't have core needle biopsy and you don't have flow cytometry, that's what your practice is going to be. But what it does, what the fine needle biopsy does, it empowers the clinical team to make a decision mm -hmm. about whether they want to excise the lymph node. So you reduce the number of excisions, which is a, a, a fantastic thing if you've got a system which is stressed and you've got large numbers of patients waiting for an excision biopsy of their lymph node, whereas the fine needle biopsy can triage those and identify the patients that you need to do your excision. That's in an environment where you don't have flow and you don't have um, immunistic chemistry. Mm -hmm.